Hello, everybody. On behalf of CAI and the great IT professional, I'd like to welcome you all today to this panel discussion on understanding machine learning and its impact. My name is Michael Malutis, and I will be your moderator for today's event. As a reminder, all attendees have been muted. You can hear myself and the other panelists, but, uh, but you, if you want to communicate us, you'll have to use the chat features or the Q&A features. Today's webinar is being brought to you and sponsored by CAI's Great IT Professional. The Great IT Professional is an on-demand continuous learning platform for IT professionals that puts continuous learning at your fingertips. We have over a thousand long form lectures that cover the entire spectrum of IT management, and you can access all of it from our main website at greatpro.org or from our iOS and Android mobile apps. I'd like to say a few words about our panelists today before we get started. Uh, Dr. Larry Dribben is a consultant and educator who assists organizations understand and adopt new technologies and new government regulations. His consulting company, the Pearl Street Group, provides program and project management, process improvement and measurement consulting services to both business and information technology organizations. Dr. Dribben is also an adjunct instructor at DePaul University, Chicago's College of Computers and Digital Media, where he teaches a variety of courses in cloud computing and software engineering. Don Schaefer developed Athens Group's oil and gas practice and leads engineers in delivering software engineering services for exploration, production, and pipeline monitoring systems for international clients. An IEEE senior member, he is a software engineering subject matter expert for the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Athens Group is available internationally to assist organizations struggling with securing their information and operational technology networks from cyber criminals. They have also mitigated Stuxnet and internet trolls. With 10 plus patents, PMP, Certified Scrum Master, and Scaled Agile Framework certifications, Henry Will brings innovation, leadership, and soft skills to all of his successful teams. He has led initiatives in the IBM Watson Group, leveraging AI services for external clients, and he started a PMO for a London-based startup doing AI work with a top 10 US telecom enterprise. Henry now leads artificial intelligence work on several chatbots for a global firm involved in human capital management and payroll. Henry is passionate about serving, helping people understand complex topics in a way that allows practical application and also serving as part of his Christian beliefs. Before we get started with the panel, I'd just like to let everyone know once again that you are free to submit your questions in written form during the course of the live panel. I will do my best to try to field your questions dynamically and organically as they come in and integrate them into the flow of the conversation. However, if that doesn't happen, we will take I will take all of your questions at the very end during the Q&A session. And if you'd like to save your questions for the end, you can post them at that time. Uh, if you have any technical problems, you can also use the chat feature to notify me or the host, and we will do our best to try to troubleshoot that for you uh, during the course of the of the conversation. So I think we've covered all the opening remarks. I'd like to thank all of you for your uh, for your patience. I think we're ready to get started. So I want to do something new for today's panel discussion. I'd like before we get into this, I'd like each of our panelists to attempt to describe machine learning at at three different levels. I'd like to have it described uh, as if it was being described each major. I'd like it described as if it was being described to an a typical IT manager or a rank and file IT worker. And finally, I'd like it described as if it was uh, being described to an aspiring data scientist or a grad student who was somewhat sophisticated in, in computer science. And so we're going to start this little uh, exercise before we get into the panel discussion. I want to hand it to Don and have Don make an effort to try to explain machine learning and what it is to a teenager. So take it away, Don. Thank you very much, Michael, and I want to thank the other presenters, and I want to thank all of you who are uh, who are attending today. I think you're going to find this fairly interesting. When I when I think about how do I present this to a teenager, I think of my uh, grandson. I've got a grandson who's who's 12 years old. Um, this is the second summer in a row that he's been off to uh, Google Programming Boot Camp here in Austin, Texas. So although he may seem to be an outlier, liar, I've uh, met and been to some of his presentations, and there's hundreds of uh, tweens and teenagers who are uh, taking courses. Also, when you talk about teenagers today, the teenagers today have never been without a smartphone or an iPad. Um, laptops are something we old fogies use. 
So they understand, they may not understand what they're using, but they know how to use all of the tools. If you ask a teenager what, what are their favorite apps on their phone, uh, most times they, they don't say Twitter and they don't say email. What they say is, I use TikTok. And, and you can explain to them that machine learning is used to do a lot of the transitions that you have in TikTok when you change, uh, you change the different characters and you change characterizations. Ask them if they use Amazon. If they use Amazon, they know that they've been uh, been recommended things. That's that's an enormous amount of big data, data mining, and machine learning that provides them with these uh, recommendations on what to use. And and finally, if they if they use any of the music apps, and most of them do, um, bringing up iTunes and asking for a song today generates you an instant playlist, and you get a full playlist of things you might be interested in. So, depending on what type of music you want, one question will give you a full playlist. So, when you look at, when you talk to a teenager today, you don't have to say, you know, you're using machine learning and, uh, and big data and these things. You can say, tell me the apps you're using and just start from there. Larry, great, great response, Don. Larry, why don't you help us out? Imagine I'm a, your typical IT, mid-career IT manager, and you want to try to explain this to me. How would you begin? Well, before I do that, I want to go back to the grand grandchildren. And uh, I have a granddaughter and a grandson, and both eleven. They're twins, and um, they're both actually learning how to solder right now. So they're uh, they're doing things that uh, that age that I never never did. The world is uh, a different age. Besides, they've had iPhones from the day they could hold the phone. Um, to me, if I'm talking about uh, uh, to a, a IT person, I'd say basically. Uh, machine learning is uh, writing computer programs uh, using data to help computers make decisions and make recommendations, similar to but not exactly the way people think. I, I think that we don't really understand how people think that whole process, so uh, we'll just leave it at just making uh, better decisions, making that better, but making decisions and making uh, recommendations. That recommendation could be from what's the next program you'd like to watch on uh, on TV or on Netflix uh, to uh, talking to uh, Alexa or Siri to say, play me that next song that Don was working about. Those are all examples of um, machine learning uh, in, in action. Thank you, Larry. And finally, the uh, we give the honors of, to our special guest today, Henry Will, to give us a uh, the the mo what I would consider the most sophisticated explanation is if you were a aspiring data scientist or uh, a grad student who uh, was uh, marinated in computer science classes, and uh, how would you go about uh, explaining machine learning uh, in 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 two minutes? Sure, uh, thank you, Michael, and and thanks for all those that are attending today for listening in. It's an honor to be able to be part of this discussion and this panel. With these esteemed uh, representatives <laughs> that know so much more than I do. But I would say that uh, if you were somebody that was thinking about going into a career in data science or machine learning, uh, one of the things I would say to you is, first of all, are you interested in working with data? Because machine learning is all about volumes of data. Uh, the reason that we want to work with data is because we look at a lot of data and machine learning is to create a model that represents that data. If you wanna say it's a representation or it's a way to estimate data points that are in between ones that we don't have. So we wanna work with a real lot of data, which means that if you wanted to get into this field, you'd wanna be somebody that was interested in working with other teams within a, an enterprise or even a small company or maybe consulting to try to find what kind of data is available out there? Uh, where can you find the data? Where can you collate this data and get the data that's needed in order to answer the business questions? So not only do you need to be able to work with data, but you need to work with people, which means that you're going to want to come up with some type of a business solution, uh, work towards a business solution, because this has to have a return on investment and it has to have value to the business, right? which ultimately is value to whoever that business is serving. You know, 
who who is the market for that business and how can you serve that business so you're going to want to be somebody that is uh, interested in diving into data pulling it together cleansing it and getting into a way that you can work with that data to come up with a model that represents that data so you can say you know i've got you know 10,000 data points but i can extrapolate that by, by creating a model with machine learning into many many more data points as a representation of that data and turn that into something that's going to have value to a business and ultimately to the people that that business is serving so you're going to want to work with people you're going to want to work with data you're going to want to be able to come to an outcome so that there's value in it great answers from everybody great way to get this thing started i want to ask a follow-up question uh based on um henry's response and i uh which is when you talk about you you know you know we, we got a lot of great uh pieces of information there you know you're dealing with large amounts of data uh, you're dealing with the ability to sort of, uh, you want to find a way to make decisions off of that data, to have predictive capability off of that data, uh, and you use models as a way to represent the data. And of course, you're doing all of this towards some types of business solution, okay? You're trying to basically create business value. So these questions that you have to ask are about creating business value. And, uh, but you mentioned models, that the models actually represent the data. Uh, what are these models what do they actually consist of how how much of this stuff is can people get off the shelf how much of it is basically already out there they can get open source and get from libraries uh, is there any kind of tweaking or customization that needs to get done like what how do they actually work and 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 how does one kind of actually leverage them if you if you were put into this of a well, somebody program? somebody would want to be able to be somebody that's comfortable using mathematics right because uh, if you think about a model on the easiest and the most uh, easy to understand or simplistic viewpoint, uh, we do this every day when we think of a model uh, that might be based on just drawing a straight line, okay? Uh, we can represent, we might have only five points on a line uh, that represent, you know, some input and some output, and then we extrapolate in between those, you know, uh, think about you know, uh, gas mileage or something for a car, right? Uh, you know, I can take uh, readings on how much gas I put into my car and how many miles I travel, and I can plot those on a line and I can say, you know, look, I'm getting this average gas mileage on the highway and this is my average gas mileage around town or whatever. So that would be the easier for representation if you want to think of creating a model for what my gas mileage is on my car. But then if you want to extend that, you can consider that that could even be more complex. The things that add complexities to models are having more variables, right? Or sometimes we call them features in machine learning. And you can have multiple features that work into a model and a model could be more than a straight line. If you think about what we call regression is one type of model. Uh, we talk about doing polynomial regression, right? Where uh, you have a polynomial, which is a curved line, and it can have all kinds of wiggles and squiggles in it that represent the data. Uh, we can talk about classification models. Uh, we mentioned before about, you know, talking about, you know, recommendation engines, right? Where you have a bunch of different uh, features or variables that might affect somebody's choice uh, when they're picking like a movie to watch on Netflix or a thing to buy on Amazon. Uh, taking all those different variables into play and coming up with a model that represents that data so that you can extend that again into a business solution. So a model is a representation of the data and there's several different ways that this can be done in machine learning. But on the simplistic side of it, just think of a model as something that represents the data. And, you know, I did mention that a lot of times we like to work with a lot of data, but there's other situations where sometimes machine learning will take in a small amount of data and start to extrapolate and learn from that. There's something called reinforcement learning where we tend to let the system try to figure out, uh, you know, extrapolate from the data and figure out how to represent that by making, if you want to say, predictions in the data. So there's a lot of different areas, but if you want to work with it, you talked about languages. There's many, many, uh, you know, packages out there that are available, especially in Python, which is the most, right now, it's the most popular language, but there's others like R. Uh, there are many packages available that allow you to do this. And one of the things I would suggest 
and I did this in my earlier talk about AI uh, that I did for IT Pro was to talk about the, you know, there's a, there's a website called Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E, and I'll send out a link to a couple of blog posts I did on this later, but that website has ways that you could get introduced to machine learning and you can actually work with it if you want to. But for somebody that's a manager level, maybe they don't need to have that level of detail. They just need to know what exactly machine learning is about. And it's based on a model that represents data. And there's a certain process that you have to go through to get to the right solution to create that model and then use it for business value. Great. That was incredibly helpful to me. I know. I, I know about the audience, but that was very nicely put and very well framed. And thank you for, for that that very nice summary. You did mention reinforced learning or reinforcement learning as a way that the model can actually learn and be able to make predictions. Uh, from my uh, research about this, I've come across other types of learning that are mentioned when people talk about machine learning. They talk about things like supervised learning, unsupervised learning. Don or Larry, do either of you, uh, one of you, want to try to help our audience understand what the what these things mean when they're when they're if they're starting to learn a little bit about machine learning and they come across terms like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforced learning. How it, might you differentiate uh, these these concepts? Go ahead, Larry. Why don't you take a shot at it? In in terms of machine learning, uh, I guess that's sort of the simplistic way of building models. Fairly, uh, what's the right term? Uh, pick it, the, the whole idea with the model is to pick a model that best represents reality, and we don't always know how to do that. In in supervised learning, and I think it's sort of a misnomer. It means that the data we have has labels. We have label data. And based on that data, so it might be height and weight, and it might be, let's say, one of the things we want to pick is, let's say, uh, for a, the upcoming football season, uh, who's going to be a, a linebacker and who, who's going to be a running back. Right? And so we look at players with height and weight, and now we can organize them and see if there's a difference between, let's say, a running back and a, and a linebacker. And that would be a type of model using supervised learning, where we put the data in of the players, we organize it, and then it creates create a model for that. Unsupervised learning, we don't have labels. It's unlabeled data. And in that case, we let the computer try and figure out what the actual labels would be. So going way back, and I'll give you a very primitive example, there's a technique called factor analysis. Uh, factors are different than variables. Variables are labeled. Factors are not. And the factors that one of the first tests they did before even computers is they looked at a, a square. And from that square said, well, or, or uh, a, a cube uh, or some kind of rectangle. So let's look at all the dimensions for a, a cube. They had height, the weight, and depth. They had a, a perimeter value, area. Uh, diagonal value between the points and they put all that data into the computer and said what's the best way of representing a rectangle and using this factor analysis technique they came up with uh guess what height width and depth even though they put in many different other combinations you could do that same thing with these football players but not putting in height and weight but put in just data about them and let the computer organize it that would be basically unsupervised learning. Those are basically aspects of uh, machine learning. We can get one level more, and I think we can get more into that is uh, deep learning using neural nets. Those two examples, we don't need neural nets. We just come up with models based on either linear algebra or something like that. Uh, when we get into deep learning, now we're getting into models that are much more complex, that oftentimes we don't even know how they're made because the computers uh, make them themselves, and uh, we can let someone else maybe explain that a little more. Uh, I so, would, well, go, ahead, go ahead, Don. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think Larry, that that's great. Uh, I'd like to give a couple examples from from projects uh, we've done. In that, several of these we start out with basically unsupervised learning. We had a lot of data. Uh, an example of this was. Um, Retail pricing. How do you how do you know when to redo your retail pricing? 
and and you have to look across inventory. You've got there's an enormous amount of data that you have to look at. So we first started looking at this data by just doing data visualization. What are the how do I classify the data? How do I look at the data? And from there we moved into what became supervised learning because all of a sudden we started looking at what were the solutions and the solution that we were looking for in order to do, you know, minimize the risk in setting up what the next price point should be was a regression analysis. And and we literally went through multiple reg regressions and, and here's where as uh, as Henry said, it's important to understand uh, at least a little bit about mathematics. What we honed in on after we looked at all the data was a Kuebyshev series, and Kuebyshevs are eighth and ninth order polynomials. And we then used those to determine what was the best price fit. And, and it was all done, it was you know basically machine learning through regression analysis. We looked at big data through data visualization, but you have to, there's not one piece that you start with. You have to look at the broad spectrum of the tools that are available to you in, in machine learning and data analysis before you can really come up and decide, here's my solution. You guys are hitting it out of the park. These are wonderful. Uh, you're, it, it's very clear, clear as day, the way you're, you're explaining this to our audience, and I really appreciate that. I had a follow-up though, another follow-up. Um, Larry had meant, and anybody can take this. Larry mentioned uh, deep learning and talked about neural nets. I have a two part question related to deep learning. The first part is can somebody explain what very succinctly what the relationship is between deep learning and, and machine learning? I think there's a lot of confusion out there in the marketplace and in our audience about about these things. And I want to make sure people understand understand that. And secondly, uh, when uh, Larry was talking about supervised learning and unsupervised learning. He said that supervised learning involved unlabeled data. I often hear this term unstructured data when I'm reading about deep learning, that it, it, it leverages unstructured data. Is unstructured data basically a synonym for unlabeled data or does it have some other connotation? And then remember the first part of the question is, can you help us understand the, the difference between and similarities between deep learning and machine learning? Anybody? <laughs> Yeah, if you if you want to, I'll do the first part of that question, which is the difference between machine learning and deep learning. Actually, deep learning is considered to be a subset of machine learning. Uh, machine learning also takes into place uh, things like we talked about, like uh, categorization and regression uh, to represent things with. Uh, you, know, you talked about an nth level. I mean, a ninth level polynomial. My goodness, um, but using math to represent. Uh, you know, points and create a model out of that. Uh, so deep learning is a subset of machine learning where uh, we're using neural networks. You've heard neural networks. What are neural networks? Well, they're based on neurons, which is what our brains are based off of. So it's, it's a, if you want to say it's a uh, way to represent what is in the human mind, right? The way that the human brain works is through synapses that are connected, they're all interconnected, and there's tons and tons of them. I forget what the count is, but it's a very large number. And they're connected uh, in our brain. And the idea is that with deep learning, we create neurons, uh, which each of them have a weighting factor that comes into them from other neurons. And these can be N levels deep. Uh, and these are, uh, take the data in and process it through these neural networks uh, to create an answer. So one example of that would be recognizing digits and like visual recognition, right? Uh, and you can actually see, I think on this blog post that I had, I think I added it to there, a uh, really interesting graphic that shows how you take this data in, which has pixels on, a, on an array that show where people wrote numbers zero through nine and takes that data in and through these, through the neural network, through the success, successive levels of this neural network on the output, it gives us either it's a zero, a one, a two. Now it's not always 100% accurate, but it's pretty accurate. And you can see like, where would this be used? Well, the postal service uses it, right? They've been using this for years when people write their zip code on their, on their envelope and put it in the mail. Do you think somebody's sitting there typing in the zip code? No, there is visual recognition looking at those digits and it tries to be as accurate as it can to find out what those digits are to get it to the right, to sort that mail and get it to the right address. So 
deep, deep learning is about neural networks when machine learning is a bigger topic and it involves not only deep learning, but it also involves other types of models to represent the data. And when you talk about deep learning, we've had neural networks since the 50s that we've built artificial neural networks. They weren't very deep. They were very expensive to build and operate two, three levels. Now that we've had much cheaper computer components, we've got to the point where we can get models that we have neural networks that are 10, 12, 15 levels deep. That's where the idea of deep learning comes in. It's a much deeper neural network. And you so look at the visualization, the first level does an analysis that may just take into account what's black and white. The next level may take in the outline of the shape. Uh, the next level, which would pass it down, and these are all probabilistic passages so that maybe it could be making a mistake and may not. Uh, could start taking into, let's say, uh, if we were looking at faces, uh, the different characteristics of a shape, nose and eyes and hairs. The next level might start looking at different kinds of the shape of eyes or the whether you have a mustache or not. And you keep going down to the final level where you get now a fairly complete representation of the individual. So when we talk about deep, it's deep uh, neural networks versus very shallow neural networks. That's again using a different technique because we don't really know exactly how the computer that these neural networks are working at each level, what they're analyzing. And that's one of the things that's uh, one of the new areas of research is how do you explain what the computer did when you're getting these, uh, not just unsupervised that we can do, but some of these more complex uh, models. We don't know how the computer actually decided what it decided, which can be important when we get into things like bias and things like that because we may need to know versus we start making decisions that are inappropriate. One of the one of the things about neural networks, and I agree, they've been around for a long time. There are lots of tools out there you can use to build your own neural network. But what I've found over the years is to, to you need to build a model of the layers yourself. And I go back to a guy that I was in graduate school with in the, uh, in the 1970s and he was in a couple of my classes and and i was working late one night in the computer center and uh, uh some statistics problems i was working on and he was a uh, he was a horse racing enthusiast and and he had built a neural network by hand drawing it out of horses and jockeys and realized that he could bet on wet tracks and the horses that were known as mudders who were in best in the mud and with the best jockeys. And he, it took him a year to build that. But after he built it, he never, he never lost. And it was a neural net. <laughs> but that's the concept of what you have. I've got a problem I need to solve and I've got these layers of data. And how do I move from one layer to the next? And when I move across that layer, what have I learned? And that's the, that's the critical issue with it. I think that was probably the best, all three of you, the best explanation of neural. I didn't understand properly neural networks until just now. So the way you've described the that the multiple levels, each of which solves a unique problem or is trying to solve a problem that in aggregate, you know, that that was very helpful to me. I kind of, but now would you, are these neural networks available? Are they open source? I mean, or do, does, do companies and enterprises have to kind of create their own neural networks if they want to use deep learning? Well, they're available on the uh, most, uh, you know, web sites. So, uh, you know, Google, Amazon have those capabilities. You just have to pay for it, set it up. Usually today, then instead of just using computers, which we're using, you know, say, five, six years ago, we're now using it advanced uh, graphics engines to do to create the neural networks, as well as in uh, Google's case, uh, tensors and TensorFlow, their whole Google library around that. So again, these you had asked earlier, all these libraries to create these are available open source. I can bring that in house. So let's say a research university would uh, get its own uh, GPU processing unit with uh, hundreds, if not thousands of GPUs and create their own neural network if they wanna do that, or they may use uh, uh, some kind of component analysis as a different model in machine learning. The key is what, it, you know, we always say, what do we want to 
solve? And then what is the best model to represent that? As well as how do we encode our data? So we have a fairly complex uh, problem that we want to get to from getting to the, what do we want? What, what models and what kind of data? And whether we look at the data first or the models, sometimes you build the model and go out and get the data. Sometimes you have the data and you want to now create, figure out what's the best model. And you might try two or three or five or 10, as, uh, as, uh, as Don was saying, before I get the model that gives me the best predictive power, if I'm predicting, uh, to get to the answers I want. I come across this uh, a lot in, you know, in my superficial kind of study about machine learning and, and whatnot. I come across this, the term training, that these models have to be trained. Uh, can anybody explain what that means? Uh, I suppose presumably it means tuning and tweaking and, and, and you're trying to improve the model, but like, can you, can anybody elaborate on that? Well, one of the models that uh, one of the tools that I've used and, and it, it's available, it's probably the best one out there now is called TensorFlow. And, and TensorFlow was built by Google um, and released about 2015. And, and when I look at, at how do I want to do that, again, it goes back to I, I draw my conceptual model of what I think, but training it means that I'm going to set these layers up and as I navigate forward and backward, through the layers, I have to I have to start looking at what answers is my neural network giving me, and are they the correct answers? And and you have to start training it that way. You can just let it go and give it all kinds of information, sit back, wait a day, and then look at the results, or you can manually go in and start forcing it because you know what the answers. You know that the you know the domain of answers, and you start throwing things that are outside that domain away. But it, it's a very it's a very hands on tuning. It's 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 not for the faint of heart or someone who doesn't understand how computers work and how to write code. You know, but Michael, it, uh, I'd like, it, it, I'd like it, to chime. Go ahead, you go first, Mariana. I was going to say the idea of training is that we need to provide a lot of data to these mm -hmm. models before they can learn. So in cases, let's say a face recognition, you need, you know, millions of pictures of various people. And if you have a billion pictures, you're going to be getting a better or more accurate model than, than a million. And that's the key. We have to provide that data to the model so it learns. That's the training data. Typically, when I do that, I hold out part of that as a validation set to say, once I've trained it, then I run that model using the of uh, the validation data that I held out and see if it still predicts well. And if it doesn't, then we don't have a good model. And that happens all the time. Uh, yeah. We can create a model that uh, over over uh, estimates, uh, underestimates, and that's even the problem. Even once I've trained the data, I've got it validated against my data set. Now I'm going over time. How do I keep that model accurate? I have to give it more data. And that's where I think we get into some real problems where computer engineers have known about how to handle that and te test data for a long time or test models. We're getting into an area where it's very hard to do that. I may get a few pieces of data that are anomalies that given that data is going to throw my model off and literally have to go back and retrain it. And uh, that's an area we're still experimenting with. You know, I look at this as we're in the very first stages of this uh, this whole modeling effort, and we're making a lot of good things happen, like Alexa and Siri and uh, the post office uh, picking up zip codes and most of us getting our mail on time. But we're going to be much, much more advanced as we go, you know, five or ten years into the future, and we learn more and more about these modeling techniques. Henry, you were going to say something. Yeah, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Let me get back to that, Michael, but I wanted to back up a little bit. You asked about what the difference is between labeled data and unstructured data and whether they're the same thing or not. Uh, just real quick on that. I want right. to make sure we, Thank you. we didn't drop that topic. But, Thank you. Uh, so uh, first, let me talk about unstructured data. Um, you know, in the past, computers worked with mostly structured data. You know, like if you think about when you go in and you put in an application for something, uh, you're filling things in specific, specific fields, 
And so there's a, let's say there's a field for your name, there's a field for your phone number, your address, this type of thing, maybe your age or whatever. Um, that's structured data because the computer knows the database someplace is keeping track of all the phone numbers, all the addresses, all the zip codes, all the you know email addresses, that type of thing. They're in structured fields. Unstructured data is like something if we think about like volumes of data that are like, let's just look at like medical journals, right? That's unstructured data. So we would use something like natural language processing to filter through all that and try to make some sense out of that unstructured data. Or sometimes data comes in from like, a, if you think about IoT, it's coming in from, you know, data devices that maybe they're all over the place with all different types of data points. And that may be structured or unstructured data too. So unstructured data is where we don't have specific fields uh, for the data. Now, it's interesting because I can see where some people might think, well, that sounds like labels <laughs> and label data. They're two different things. When we talk about machine learning about labeling data, let me give you an example that kind of gets into this supervised learning topic that we talked about before, which I think is a very good one. Let's say that we had um, somebody said that uh, they own a pet food company and they want people to send in pictures of their pets and they want to be able to sell them pet food. Uh, but the problem is that some people have dogs and some people have cats. So we want to come up with a model when they send in the pictures. We want to know whether they have dogs so we can sell them dog food or cats. We can sell them cat food. So that seems like that's a fairly simple thing. But how do we do that? Well, the first thing is we got to label a bunch of data. So now what we do is we go out and get either somebody sits down and types in look at pictures that's a dog that's a dog that's a cat that's a cat that's a cat that's a dog or we can sometimes buy data sets that already and actually there's some available open source there's sites out there that have labeled data but somebody has to sit down and say all these pictures are dogs all these pictures are cats and then we train the model using that data in this case visual recognition would be the type of model we have and we would use that to train a model to say these, we think these are all dogs. We, we, we know that these are all dogs because they're labeled that way. These are all cats. And then uh, I think it was Larry that mentioned, you know, then we want to test the data. So we have a bunch more labeled data that says these are all dogs and these are all cats. And we run that through the model to find out how accurate it is. How many times did it really get these are all dogs, or these are all cats? How many times was it accurate? What was the accuracy and precision of that? So that will help us to figure out whether our model is good and we might have to go back and tweak the model, adjust the model, do more training or whatever, and more testing until we finally have a model that does well with that test data. Now we can put that into production and we can use this to figure out whether people are sending in dog or cat pictures and sell them the right kind of dog food. So that's what supervised learning is. And we talked a little bit about um, you know, unsupervised learning where we wouldn't have that labeling of data. There's also a place in between where we have some some label data and some unsupervised. But unsupervised label uh, learning would be something like, and I, Google has an experiment around this where they have a little, uh, I guess you would say, almost like a stick model jumping over these little boxes, right? And the idea is that, you know, they train this, the training in this case is, what is the objective? The objective is to jump from box to box without falling between them. All right. So they give like a, if you want to say a goal for this unsupervised learning and they set this stick figure to jump over these boxes and sometimes it falls in between and it learns from that, that maybe I have to jump a little further if the box is higher or whatever. So that would be unsupervised learning, the case of that. Now, one thing that we have to keep into, into mind um, is that there's, you know, we can overtrain a model or we could undertrain a model. If going back to the dog and cat analogy, if we have too many dogs that look like cats or we have too many cats that look like dogs, we might start to have some bias in the data where, oh, if we have black cats, a lot of times they're misrepresented as dogs or something. Or if we have cats that are calico or something, they get some, for some reason, are being misinterpreted as. Uh, husky dogs or something. So we need to go and look at bias as something that happens sometimes when we're training models too. And we may need, we may find out that it's because we're feeding it the wrong data. We may have to feed it other representational data 
so that we don't have that bias in the data. And that is a big issue right now with machine learning is bias in the data. And we wanna make sure we take that bias out. But another thing that I wanted to mention too was, um, you know, this whole idea of uh, over or under training, we can sometimes, especially if we think about, you know, regression analysis and whatnot, and try to represent things with a curve, sometimes we can have too much data in one area and the model sometimes will, because of that, will think that that data is over representative of that, you know, of the model that we're trying to make of the data and kind of focus in on, if you want to say, focus in on that too much and over represent that case. And there we can end up with bias in even uh, something like a regression or like a polynomial type of data or classification. So we have to be careful that we don't over train the data um, when we're doing this work. So I, I have a. I have a very good, that was excellent. I have a follow-up question for the group, which is that you talk about, when you talk about this training and testing, the implication is that these models are never 100%, that there's always a margin of error. And there, there's this continuous process of trying to reduce that margin of error and improve them. But that sounds like that error is always there. It, there's, uh, there's always, it's never gonna be perfect. And then you also talk about the nature of biases. So between the margin of error that always seems to exist and the biases, how can we expect to ever see machine learning become institutionalized in say self-driving vehicles or in the healthcare industry or in hospitals or in, anything that requires dial tone perfection, otherwise people die. Okay, so, you know, and Larry, you talked about this in our pre-discussion, and maybe you could discuss a little bit about that, which is the, the, the you know, how does this pose a constraint to uh, the, the widespread adoption of machine learning if there's always gonna be some degree of error? Well, I think there's some degree of error anytime you make a decision, whether it's a person making the decision or a machine. And you say, how is it widespread? It's already widespread. How many millions of people use Alexa every day? And most of the time they get the song they want or the information they want. And the same thing for the post office. You get most of your mail, even though it's looking at handwritten zip codes. So these are very well institutionalized, even though there's a probability maybe very small that you might get the someone your neighbor's mail or someone else's mail uh, there's that's just part of life but i think when you start getting into life and death situations i think right now we have to be careful that i think we need to say the machines make the recommendations but they typically probably needed to give it over to a a, a human being to make the final decision in things like medical diagnosis they're good, but they're not that accurate, and they can be very biased or make very simple, stupid mistakes. I think Tesla was released just what uh, version nine of its self-driving car, but with the caveat that you a driver always has to be aware that every once in a while the machine, and I don't say it that way, but can do something stupid, <laughs> and that's just the the nature, you know, like that accident. I think that happened in Texas with Tesla where a, a, a semi-trailer fell over in front of the car and they didn't have any representation of that in the model. And so the car drove right into that at full speed. You know, how many times have you or I or anyone have had a semiconductor just turn over in front of us? It's not a very common occurrence. And so a human being would be able to react to that instantly, even though we've never seen that in our training model. And that's one of the things where I say, we're just in the infancy. Right now, I need billions of uh, examples to train some of these models. We don't need that to train a human being. You don't go through billions of hours of watching driving before you learn how to drive. You know, you get a couple of videos, you go out and you do it. And, and a lot of that is we've had billions of examples learning about that from the time we were infants to the time we were old enough to drive that these computer models don't have. You know, one of the best representations, if you go down to 2001 and, and hail, and they, they start deprogramming it, it starts going back and re reading nursery rhymes. I think that's one of the things that's missing in a lot of our, our models is there's a very specific for a domain, whereas humans have a much broader uh, knowledge base 
that they're drawing from and that they can with the, you know, one neuron in, in the mind has thousands of synapses connecting to other neurons and thousands of receptors. None of our computer generated uh, neuron neural networks are anywhere near that complex. So, Michael, I think the and take a shot at answering that. I I think that you know we're going to uh, we're going to see machine learning and all of its uh, uh, bits and pieces are going to be part of every product we use fairly soon. And I think you know five to ten years from now, no one will be asking these questions as to why to do it. It'll, they'll just be there, and they'll be there because it's it helps out. It cuts down on the on the human grunt work of, uh, you know, you look at robotics, uh, what robotics do, you look at uh, being able to make recommendations, anything that's not life or death. But as long as there's still life or death issues, and, and I'll give you two examples of that. One cautionary tale is from a couple of years ago, the Boeing 737 MAX, who, who made it so that the computer was smarter than the uh, pilot and co-pilot, and then the pilot and co-pilot weren't trained on how to how to disable it, and it went into a um, uh, an unknown uh, angle of attack that was unknown to the computer and crashed. The other one is um, is the Da Vinci surgery robot, and the Da Vinci surgery robot tons of software, lots of AI, incredible amount built in, but you can't use that. You can't let it go run by itself. There's a surgeon who operates it, who's got full control all the time and basically watches what's going on. There's there's actually two surgeons there doing that. Okay. And, and, I, and I know it works fine because I had some abdominal surgery on the 21st of June and it came out just perfectly. All the parts <laughs> that had to be gone are gone. <laughs> So you don't see liability issues being a major constraint because there are a we have error in in everything that we do. There's a level of risk, and also within the life and death situations, you believe that this hybrid approach is going to be used for some time to come to to mitigate those risks. That's basically well, so. of course of course there are going to be liability issues. If you yeah. get an accident, uh, someone's going to say who's at fault? Was it the the car? Was it the company that wrote the software? Was it the company who uh, de developed the sensors? Uh, there's always going to be a liability issue. It is today, and it always, always will be. I think you also have ethical issues. Mm -hmm. If you have a self-driving car and it comes into a situation where it either crashes and potentially injures the driver, or takes evasive action and injures somebody else, uh, that's not a clear-cut case for a human being let alone a computer, and now you're going to have ethical issues, and then as a result of that, legal issues. As some had said today, uh, they commonly say, if we could make uh, self-driving cars uh, better than the average person, we would be where we need to be. Well, we're probably there already today. The average, we kill 350,000, 1,000 people a day using normal people driving cars. Uh, but every time we have one accident with a self-driving car, it's big business and everybody goes back to the drawing boards. So what, what is the number that we're going to feel comfortable with that self-driving cars kill a day? It's going to be less than 1,000, more than one. Is it 20, 10, 100? That's going to be a societal decision as well as ethical and legal because we're going to have to get that all worked out. And at a national level, you can't have it different in Maine and different in Texas and drive from Maine to Texas. And then you're going to have to say, well, different sure. laws here. I need to maybe change my AI self-driving program to handle that situation. We've got a lot of non-machine learning technicalities that we have to get over before we use that in certain life and death situations. I, uh, I want to switch I, gears a bit. That was wonderful. I mean, I feel like that was a great introduction to our panel, and yet we're at the uh, 1150 mark. So, uh, but it was very, that's exactly what I, I think our audience needed. It was very comprehensive understanding about what it is and 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 how it actually works and, and, and some of the issues related to it. But I want to switch, switch gears a bit and talk about what companies are doing and business value 
Uh, and if any, uh, this is a three part question. So you can take one, you can each take one part of it, or you can take all of it if you want, uh, which is how are companies using machine learning right now in innovative ways, in innovative ways. Second, what would you say are the keys or best practices to being successful with it? And what are the ways that companies cannot be successful with it? In other words, what are examples of bad, of worse practices or common mistakes that, that an organization might make if they decide to go down this path? So three part question, how are companies using this in innovative ways? What are the keys to doing it right and being successful best practices and what might be the worst practices or, or common mistakes that people make that prevent them from realizing business value? So just, uh, okay. just, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, Henry. Okay, I was gonna say uh, some of the ways that it's being used, uh, we kind of touched on this before, but it's being used in medical situations to do things like uh, taking a look at x-rays, you know, x-ray x -ray, um, physicians are overtaxed. Uh, they get tired. Um, there, you know, there's not enough of them. There's so much work to be done, uh, especially after the pandemic. Now, uh, people are going back in droves to uh, medical uh, appointments. And, you know, for anybody that's tried to have one, you know that uh, their, their medical system's overtaxed at this point, trying to catch up and trying to get an appointment sometimes will take weeks to get one so um what they are using for sometimes in in uh, visual recognition is like looking at you know x-rays and other diagnostic uh pictures that we would have from like cat scans scans and whatnot to try to be uh if you want to say a recommender to somebody that's a physician to read those and to give recommendations of areas to look at or you know, maybe here's a couple of that, that maybe we need to take a closer look at these and see what's going on here. Again, it gets back to what Don and Larry are saying that, you know, um, in some cases, especially in these when you're talking about life and death situations, a lot of times we use machine learning to augment what people do. So it gives, it helps them to focus better. It, you know, it can work uh, 24 hours a day in the background and give recommendations and then let somebody that's a human being make the final decision. So they could be used there in medical situations. Uh, we've heard of it being used uh, for oncology. Uh, I know that IBM Watson has been used it for oncology and some of those have uh, been successful and some of them maybe not so successful, but it can make recommendations by filtering through tons of um, information from past clinical studies and past uh, you know, medical journals to find information about specific cases of oncology to help give recommendations to oncologists. So it's being used in medical fields. Uh, we mentioned before about something as simple as looking at the zip code. Um, we also see it being used um, in natural language processing and chatbots. A lot of us have uh, been able to use chatbots where we can talk, you know, it'll say, you know, this chatbot is available to give you suggestions. And gee whiz, you know, I can sit on hold for an hour waiting for it, waiting for an answer sometimes, but with a chatbot, it's working 24 hours and there's multiple of them working all at the same time. I don't have to wait in line for a chatbot. I can ask a question right away. Uh, we talked about Netflix, uh, how it's being used to make recommendations for movies and other, you know, now we got lots of streaming platforms out there that are using the same type of recommendation engines and also for shopping with like, Amazon and other type of shopping, you know, these things are ubiquitous uh, in our culture. They're being used all over the place today and in many different ways. Uh, I think that uh, maybe some of my colleagues can give suggestions of ways that they've seen them used. Uh, they are being used and they're successful in a lot of businesses. Uh, I would think that the pitfalls that we have to find out, we have to look at, we talked a little bit about bias and ethics, you know, their concerns. Uh, I think another thing that we have to look for for pitfalls is, you know, just for me being a project manager, one of the things that that I would suggest to any other project manager is one of the things is you want to make sure that you go through the process. Uh, keep in mind that you're going to have to go through, especially if you use something like supervised learning, you're going to have to try to find what is the best model and that takes time. Uh, you need to, you know, allow time for your teams to do that. You have to take time to make sure that you know, you're doing that training, you're doing that testing and going through a cyclical process. You know, I've done presentations on this before. And the thing is that a lot of times when we, we use machine learning, we're talking about a cyclical process of improving it on a regular basis. We might go into production with a first cut on it. 
and then continue to improve that training so that 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 model can get better and better with time. Yeah, I think I want to take a, a little a little different cut at it. One of the groups I'm in is a group that uh, uh, works with and uh, and helps uh, new entrepreneurs uh, develop a, a business case and a, and a plan to go forward. Literally every new company that is presenting, and we do one a week, so that's 50 a year roughly, has got some kind of AI component. A lot of them don't know what it is. A lot of them don't know how to do it. A lot of them aren't going to invest enough, but they're all talking about using AI to help it, whether it's better travel recommendations, whether it's better restaurant recommendations, uh, how to schedule a meeting better with your peers. There's all these different things, how to bet better, uh, bet it, better betting mechanisms. Uh, there's every time, you know, a robotic uh, cooking uh, they're all involved in trying to use AI. So I think Don is very right. It, it's going to be ubiquitous, but it, it's got some challenges. And it's, again, very early in, in the area. When you talk about issues, the SEI, Software Engineering Institute, has gotten involved with a lot of other things besides software in terms of uh, recommendations on processes. And they had a discussion about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And one of the biggest areas that's a problem. We've just coming out of this area of DevOps, which for our IT folks is, you know, how do we integrate better development and operations? One of the biggest areas that's a problem is in machine learning is the operation side. How do we operationalize it? So we get a model, we train it with, you know, 2 billion items of data. We validate it with our, our uh, holdout data. And now we run it for three or four months. And now how do we test it again to say, is it still making good recommendations? We don't have good mechanisms for that. And, and this is a big key. A lot of the, the data scientists aren't uh, trained as software engineers and don't really know how to operationalize or do good valid testing. And so the other comment I'm gonna make is, I don't think we have good practices. There's tons of areas we can make mistakes. And I think if you're going to get into this, and I'm going to make a, 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 a play here, not, not directly, but indirectly, go get educated. DePaul University is now putting together and expanding uh, programs on machine learning. We now went from one course to three, artificial intelligence for enterprise, data science for business, and machine learning and deep learning. These are courses I would think within two or three years, we're going to have a lot more. DePaul, you can get and uh, join, even though you're not in Chicago, they're all, all the courses are online. MIT has courses. I'm sure Lehigh University, where you are, Michael, has courses. I'm sure different courses where Don teaching are all online. I, I don't think you can, you know, we talked about this yesterday. He said, go learn this on your own. This is not an area you can learn on your own. When I was going to get my PhD, I started off just getting courses in psychology. My degrees in industrial psychology. And talking with my advisor at one time, he says, you can't do it that way. Take a course because there are going to be courses that you're not going to want to take, but you have to learn in order to be proficient in the field. I think it's the same thing being a data scientist. And not only do you have to be trained as a data scientist, and that's mm -hmm. a, all, learning how all these different models, you know, there's uh, geometric neuro, neural networks in addition to regular neural networks that learn 10 times faster. That's brand new. That's just came out in 2018 or 2019. So there's a lot of learning that has to be done to be a data scientist. But in addition to that, I strongly urge data scientists to learn more about DevOps as well as agile development so that they better understand the whole development process because they don't understand it. And that's where a ton of mistakes are being made. And that's where the biases come in. And that's where uh, the issue ethical issues come in. So, Michael, I just want to just quickly uh, jump in on this and say I agree with with everything. I think the one of the keys that we have to keep in mind is we have to do good software engineering. I, along with Larry, you know, I'm a, you know, scratch the surface and I'm an engineer. Um, in order to do any type of machine learning, big data, any type of AI ish project, you need to start with what are your requirements? You know, understand what the requirements are, build a prototype, 
you know, get define what the use case is. How are you going to use this? That's it's absolutely critical up front to do that. If you don't do that, you're just you're just a bunch of tools. You got a toolbox and you're looking for something to fix. So you need to decide what it is you're going to fix first. The other thing is you ask about some failures, and I think one of the most one of the most embarrassing failures that uh, that I've seen, and it's really pretty funny. Um, China is the world leader in face recognition. They do face recognition. They do recognition of how you walk, what your body uh, dynamics are. They do all this stuff. So a couple of years ago, uh, in one day, this woman in Beijing jaywalked multiple times, hundreds of times. The police just lost their minds. Well, not only did she jaywalk, but she was one of China's few retail uh, billionaires. And the police hauled her in and they were just reading her the riot act when what happened was she had her face on an advertisement on the side of buses. And the facial recognition picked that up as jaywalking. So we need to be careful about, about how we utilize these things. And don't scan buses for jaywalkers. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I want to uh, close on a, uh, a final question, uh, which, uh, by the way, there was a great frontline documentary about artificial intelligence. If anybody's interested, they want to find it on YouTube. And there's a wonderful quote from it. They said that um, they said data is the new petroleum and China is the new Saudi Arabia. And that gets to this point that I think Henry was trying to make about large unstructured data sets. And what is and what is the ultimate large unstructured data set? A continuous 24 seven video feed on every street corner in every major metropolitan area in China, for instance, I'll give you an example. Okay. I would say that probably qualifies as unlabeled data. Okay. And the more data, the more the the more powerful these models can be, the more they can learn. And and so I think that getting access to larger and larger amounts of data is going to be key to fueling this. But there's other things that are going to fuel it in the future. And that's where this next question is leading, which is about the future. What are there what what do you see with the increase in, in computing power? Uh, are there any uh, opportunities, any constraints, uh, things that are going to hold us back? say with advanced chip manufacturing, which I think is a prerequisite. These things require enormous amounts of computing power. And, and is that a constraint? Are we going to see breakthroughs perhaps with quantum computing? We read about all these other technologies that are out there, uh, such as the blockchain and, 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 and I said quantum computing and, and whatnot and, and new chips um, and how these things might be able to converge. Uh, what do you see is uh, where we're going to be in say five, six, or seven years, and how do you see what do you see in terms of being constraints or opportunities coming from from techn other technologies? Well, I, I'm, I'll start, but I think it's obviously a very broad question. I think again, we're just in the infancy. So I mentioned geometric neural networks. A typical neural network for face recognition is going to have to look at uh, faces. Head on, and as I turn my head, the same need examples of people in different orientations. So we can get a person walking on the street sideways and say, that's the same Larry Dribben that I see head on. And to do that, I need many, many pictures of that individual. A geometric <laughs> neural network looks at it a little differently and looks at the face as a three dimensional object. And can auto rotate, so it needs far less data to be able to identify an individual. We're going to have more and more advances like that, not just in the raw chip power, which is getting more massive constantly, but as engineers and innovators and inventors are coming up with new and new ways of handling models, handling various kinds of unstructured data, we get into the um, I think it was Don who mentioned yesterday getting into uh, IoT kind of data, and instead of getting the digital version of it, to actually get the analog feed and analyze that. So there are all kinds of things that's kind of coming both from hardware and software as we get new techniques, better models. Again, we're in the infancy. I have no idea where it's going to. I have an idea where it's going to go, but I have no idea what's the next big thing that's going to happen. Right now, the models are crude, 
They're brittle, like Don said, seeing the picture on the uh, 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 side of the bus. Or we, we know that models are very biased. I, I'm working with a dermatologist. Most pictures of uh, moles on skin are of white white skin. And there's a whole area of, uh, you know, a, a cut, mole recognition on, on skin of people of skin of color. There's not as many cases. We are better at picturing. I'm not as worried about China because their data is about Chinese data and it doesn't translate very well, I don't think, to the way in which we live in either the US or Europe. They may be very good at picking models and prediction for uh, the China world. They're not gonna be very good for picking uh, models for, for us, at least not for quite a while. Uh, but that's just the start, uh, Don, uh, Harry, Henry, Go ahead, Henry. I was going to say that, um, you know, it's hard to predict where it's going to go. I mean, I don't think that we're going to end up with something like the Terminator universe where uh, AI is going to take over because uh, a lot of AI right now is very specific domain centered. Uh, we can go into that whole subject, but uh, as time requires, uh, let's just say that I don't think we're going to get to that point, but we are going to see AI and machine learning take a bigger, bigger piece of the way that we come up with solutions, business solutions to add value to things for businesses and for people in general, because that's what businesses deal with. The thing is, I think the question that everybody should be asking themselves is not so much where is it going, but how do I get on that train <laughs> to where it's going? Sure, there's going to be projects that don't use any machine learning or AI, but there's going to be a lot of them that are going to start using that. And I think that everybody should ask the question, is it something that they want to get involved in and learn about? I think that uh, I just asked if we could post there as a blog link that I did there about how you can play with AI and learn about AI. I think that, you know, here Larry and Don had mentioned other ways that you can learn about AI. There's lots of ways to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would suggest that everybody at least look into it if if nothing else, at least to be able to carry on conversations with people and talk intelligently about it. Uh, and you're going to get the close. You're going to get the honors here. Um, oh. you, you go ahead. You can I, close I, with remark. Before Don does right. that, I had one other thing though. As we start getting more and more use of computers and AI and, and robots, there's a lot of social challenges that we're going to have to come up with too. As, as the machines get much better, let's say, at, at reading uh, uh, x-rays, now we need less x-ray technicians. Maybe as they get better, we need less dermatologists. And as we need less and less, certainly we get automatic uh, uh, trucks, uh, self-driving trucks. That's 2 million uh, truck drivers that we don't need in the U.S. alone. What is society going to do? How are we going to handle that? And we saw Iceland ex experimenting with a, a four-day work week. What's going to happen when we get to the point where the machines start taking over more and more of the menial jobs and start taking over more and more of the higher level thinking jobs? Uh, are we going to have a two day work week, a one day work week? How's that going to fit in our current political environment where we literally can't have a dialogue on, on what's even truth? We've got some real <laughs> challenges that I think all this uh, innovation in uh, machine learning and AI is going to cause. Don. Thanks, Larry. Gosh, you, you just stole my thunder. I can't believe it. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, I, I think that, you know, AI, machine learning, big data, this is the oldest new technology that we're working with. We've got to remember that the roots of AI go back to Alan Turing and the Turing test and the Turing machine, which he devised after working on the Enigma machines at Blenchley Park in World War II. So this is something that we've moved forward and it's one of those areas that we've never had enough compute power. The first, first system that I worked on, the first one that had was an expert system and did machine learning and had enormous amounts of data. Um, we had to use a Cray as the back end data machine. We had 50 different types of AI machines in a network with faxes and everything else. In order to do that same thing today, I can replicate that on my MacBook Pro. So we've got all those things. We talk about how to you know, generate this and how to understand it. I agree with everybody who said, learn how to do it, play with some things and really, really look at it. 
what's going to hold us back, and again, it's not, I, I completely, um, I, I think that we'll solve the problems of computing. We'll get to quantum computing. We'll get to wherever we need to. That's not going to hold us back. My fear is that our biggest, the biggest risk we take is one of ignorance. And, and that's the ignorance of our political class trying to put rules in place about things they don't understand, uh, putting rules in place that defy science. Um, the vaccine is where we're at today with the vaccine is a perfect example. You either believe science or you don't believe science. Well, that's going to be a stumbling block if people aren't going to believe that the next step in automation is going to be a certain amount of machine learning and you're going to have to turn things loose to your machine. And I agree, it's not going to be the Terminator world because face it, we're still the ones who build it and you know there's going to be hundreds of bugs in it. Michael, Although remember, Elon Musk is concerned that they are, the threat of AI is AI itself. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. And I and I've and read I know that books, there are a couple books, of um, well. <laughs> machines that were doing some advanced work and they connected them together to talk and they created their own language that I think we're still trying to figure out how to interpret. So there is that uh, you know as we get more and more advanced AI and they get better at general uh, intelligence, who knows what we're going to create? Hopefully, it's not a Terminator world or a Matrix world, but. I don't think we can guarantee that either. Well, there, one of the, I forget who said it. I think several of you made this point, which is about ignorance and about education and the importance mm -hmm. of, you know, knowledge. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways you can go about that. But one of the best investments I ever made was $10 a month for my YouTube premium subscription. Okay. And I'll tell you why it's because there's I know people get very irritated. I'm not shilling for YouTube. They don't need anybody to show for them, but they, because you remove the ads, the advertisements are very disruptive and you can get turned off YouTube very quickly as a learning tool. If you're constantly being interrupted with ads that you don't want to watch, you pay $10 a month, they remove the ads and you can also run YouTube in the background while you have another application open. That's another perk. One of the great things about YouTube, I don't care what the subject is. I don't care if you're trying to improve your abs, lose weight, speak Croatian, or understand machine learning. You can do it in five minute chunks. Enough. Larry and I talk about this all the time. What does it mean to know enough to be able to get to the next level? As Henry said, it might just mean enough to be able to have an intelligent conversation with people that you work with, or it might just mean enough to be able to sit in on a panel discussion like this and have a mental model that allows you to kind of ask the right questions and, and put information in the right boxes. You don't have to be an expert overnight. One of the great things about YouTube is that everything is compartmentalized in little five minute lectures, seven minute lectures, 12 minute lectures from thousands of different people that are all committed to service and to providing knowledge to people with no agenda. You can find hundreds of people out there that are willing to educate you about anything. So I think it's a wonderful place to start. You don't have to go back to school, but if you can, great. But uh, the other thing is, and I would be remiss if I, I, I got to make this point here, is uh, we'd love to be your partner on this journey. Okay, I hate to put an advertisement here, but like as Don and Larry and even Henry know, they are all regular presenters with us with the Great IT Pro. We have over a thousand of these lectures. They're not YouTube size. They tend to be like 60 minutes long or sometimes even a little bit longer than that. But you can you can go to our website at greatpro.org. You can surf all this content across all these different categories. We are trying to be your partner on this. And that's one of the reasons why we built this panel series was to go into some of these cutting edge topics in greater detail so that you can get jump started. Okay. A panel discussion like this will take you from zero to like 25 miles an hour instantly and give you enough of a mental model so that now you can go off on your own you're inspired and you have a bit of a framework so that you can start asking good questions and learning through youtube and the great it pro so that's what we're trying to do here and i wanted to really emphasize that because i think it's all about continuous learning that's how the difference between finding your place in this new world and potentially being unfortunately displaced by it is the ability to stay current with with what's going on and that's what we're here for um, I do have a couple of questions that uh, came in um, that have been sitting here patiently, and I didn't really understand them. They kind of went over my head. So hopefully, somebody from our panel will will have the uh, will be able to, to 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 handle this. This gets back to the beginning of their talk when we're talking about labeled data and unlabeled data. The questioner says unlabeled data is used for cluster analysis. Are there natural clusters of data? 
that could perhaps be labeled in some useful way. Not quite sure I understand, but maybe somebody here can take a stab at that. Well, there are, are there natural are, clusters of data that could be. Say, that yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are classification algorithms that will take uh, unlabeled data and try to classify them according to the features or the, if you want to say, the parameters that they're involved with. I'm not sure exactly where the question is going, but uh, you know, they would group them into clusters where they would be similar with each other, and that would be the model that you would come out with. Of course, you, you know, you want to do some, again, like I mentioned before, you want to do testing on any model that you create. So you'd have to make sure that you came up with some way to test that data. Okay, excellent. I have another question that's been um, here waiting. Again, over my head, but that's not hard to do. <laughs> Uh, what are the trades involved, or the, I think they mean the trade-offs, what are the trades involved in building synthetic data for training purposes? If faced with a shortage of real data and sy synthetic data is the only option, what are the potential pitfalls which we should be aware of? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that, oh. I, okay, I was going to say that we have that situation in some of the work that I've been doing where uh, people will try to come up with synthetic data. And um, one of the biggest pitfalls is it's not only representative of what you're actually working on. You know, um, it, it could introduce bias. It could also introduce errors in the way that the model works. You know, that big difficulty with using synthetic data there. So one of the things that, uh, you know, what I've worked with before in machine learning is uh, if you have a shortage of real data, sometimes you just have to deal with that shortage rather than try to be tempted to create uh, synthetic data when that synthetic data actually can throw off your model. I mean, there, I'm sure there's cases where, yes, we might be able to accurately come up with representative data that's synthetic, but for the most part, at least in the work that I've been doing, we try to stay away from doing that because it can throw off the model and make that model become uh, you know, misrepresentative of the real data. I think one of the keys and in, in two of the two of the projects uh, we've done uh, when we talked about the uh, retail pricing model, we actually generated synthetic data because we we had a very good understanding of the uh, of the domain. I think if you understand the domain, you can you can do that. And we basically uh, generated millions of rows of data using Excel, because Excel allowed me to uh, put it in the right format that the real data was in. We actually took a selected set of data from uh, from one of the point of sale systems, and then we just replicated that and used that as the model. And we found out that we were about ninety eight percent accurate with the data we generated. Another one was you referred to the uh, you referred to the um, this was in a, an oil rig and we were collecting data to do a drilling advising and what we found was we we'd started with uh, digital data we started with the the digital data that was had had been converted and we realized that there were biases in that data and it didn't work it actually generated more of it but it had smoothing in it and some other things that we just didn't want so we had to go back to the analog data and the way we tested that was we just we have a lab and we just had uh, programmable logic computers with sensors in the lab and we just ran the sensors through the uh, PLC and captured all the uh, analog data and and realized that that's how we'd have to go so I think if you understand the domain, you can generate good data. If you don't understand the domain, go back to what Henry said, take a small set that you understand and, and use that to train. I think you also have to be very careful. There's another question there, Michael, on can we use a probability to uh, yeah. use a minor color technique to reuse the same data? You have to be very, very careful in statistical analysis reusing the same data over and over again leads to a lot of errors and bias and that's where you get overfitting models so no you don't you cannot do that if you have a lot of data better to put it through once to train your model to get it more accurate than running it again and again and again just to just for the benefit of our audience i want to read that question out uh 
again, uh, and also in, in case Henry and, and Don want to respond, it says, can the probability of machine learning getting an incorrect answer be reduced through multiple runs being summarized like Monte Carlo analysis? And I think what, what Larry is saying is no, quite the opposite. I believe. Uh, I think there's a danger with Monte Carlo analysis too. A lot of the things we think are getting more and more, if we don't really start out with real randomness up front in our mm -hmm. original data, we just we're using the same data and you, you can, it's a very basic uh, issue with uh, statistical analysis that you can get very high uh, uh, mm -hmm. agreement one time, but the next time you run the model on real data, it just gets a little it's zero. Yeah, too, too, many, to too many Monte Carlo runs make it look like a least squares fit. Well, I I couldn't be happier with today's panel discussion. Uh, I want to thank uh, Larry, Henry, and Don for, uh, for joining us today and also for our audience. We've got a lot more of these planned this year. Uh, so if you got value out of this, please stay tuned. We're going to be holding one. Actually, we're doing a special uh, broadcast on CRISPR in August. And then we have a we, we, we're going to do an Internet of Things panel discussion in September and stay tuned. You can uh, subscribe to us, get our mailers to the great IT pro. We'll try to keep you updated about uh, about our progress. But again, as I mentioned, we'd like to be your partner on this journey of, of discovery and, and of continuous learning. So thank you all for being here today. It was my honor to sort of facilitate this lively discussion. We'll see you at future panel discussions. Take care. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you, Michael, and thank everybody for attending. It was really, uh, really good. Yeah, thank you.